So welcome back. Hope everyone had a nice little break. Um, next, we are going to hear from Dr. Jenny Green and Yamale Antoine uh, regarding problematic sexual behavior. So I'll introduce the two of them. Um, Dr. Green, following graduation from the University of Florida with a bachelor's in medical degree, moved to Louisville for her pediatric residency training at the University of Louisville. And upon completion of her residency, um, she completed a child abuse pediatrics fellowship at the University of Louisville. So she is one of our child abuse pediatricians here with Norton Children's um, Pediatric Protection Specialists and faculty at the University of Louisville as an assistant professor of pediatrics. She also evaluates patients um, at the Child Advocacy Center in Louisville and Southern Indiana and is active in committees for the PSANE program development, the Norton Child Abuse Task Force, Face It, among others. Jenny um, lectures about child maltreatment frequently to health healthcare students, providers, and social workers. So thank you so much for being here today. And then Yamale Antoine graduated from Transylvania University with a degree in psychology and completed her master's degree at the Kent School of Social Work at the University of Louisville with a specialization in marriage and family therapy. Um, she's a licensed clinical social worker and has worked at the Cosier Charities Child Advocacy Center for the past six years as a forensic interviewer and became the associate director two years ago. So welcome to you both. And again, thank you for being here and educating us on this important topic. Thank you so much for the introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. Okay. Are you all able to hear me okay? See the slides okay? Just a thumbs yes. up. Is Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to be, uh, like like uh, Dr. Doc said, my name is Jenny Green. Um, if you work at Norton Children's, it's very likely that we've taken care of some of the same patients, just given the frequency that I feel like um, we see patients for child abuse and neglect here at the Children's Hospital um, and just in surrounding places. So childhood sexual behaviors are um, one of the more difficult topics probably to engage with parents about there's a lot you know going through medical school and peds residency and even uh, fellowship you know i had to it wasn't something that was like explicitly stated to me or if it was i obviously didn't remember very well so i apologize if it was um, but it's something that i've had to refer back to multiple times it's something that i talk to our team about pretty frequently because the identification of problematic sexual behaviors and differentiating normal versus abnormal is extremely important. One of the reasons, obviously, is because we want to be able to identify children who need help. Um, and then the other reason, obviously, is we want to be able to provide guidance to parents about what normal sexual behavior is and provide reassurance if the behavior is, in fact, not of the problematic type. So the main objectives would be to understand or at least have an understanding of typical versus atypical sexual behavior development determine some positive, uh, describe some possible contributing factors to the development of sexual behavior problems, understand um, the basis of the, the medical evaluation when a child comes in for child on child sexual abuse or sexual assault. So basically, um, when one child uh, victimizes the other, for lack of a better word, um, and, and just how you approach that medical evaluation, um, not only for the child who comes in who is the victimized child, but also for the sexually reactive youth or the offending child. Um, and acknowledge, and Ms. Antoine actually, um, for the associate director of the CAC, will be the one to talk about like treatment and different things because she is our mental health expert. So child sexual behavior development is, again, kind of a stick, sticky topic for a lot of folks. Um, and I think it's just important to understand that just like any other developmental process, it just doesn't happen the day a child you know, starts going through puberty. It's really a progression. And they're obviously just like with motor development and speech development and even just social emotional development, there are stages. Um, and trying to identify those behaviors as more typical versus atypical, again, is really important for um, any area of development, but in, including sexual behavior development. You can see the sexual behaviors from toddler age up. When they do studies with regard to sexual behaviors in youth, as you can imagine, it's probably extremely hard to get data or even um, more so even get accurate data <laughs> because the likelihood of a child um, even anonymously describing, you know, their behaviors in youth 
can be uh, uncomfortable. And then the ability for adults to remember their own sexual behavior development obviously is, is wrought with a lot of, of bias and different things like that. When they do try to collect this data, they found that about 50% of kids reported that they engaged in at least one sexual behavior, more typical sexual behavior before their 13th birthday. Um, obviously, like I said, it can be very difficult uh, to collect this type of data. So definitely take that with a grain of salt. I think it's probably a, a pretty vast underestimation. And that the behaviors that we're talking about can start as typical. And whether it be the introduction of a traumatic episode or loss of a caregiver or something like that, those behaviors can progress from typical to atypical. And again, understanding when that progression is occurring is important for recognition. So in general, the childhood sexual behavior development stages are going to vary by age, just like any other developmental stage for the most part. So in preschool children, which they define as being less than four years of age, obviously there's going to be, you know, exploration of their private parts. They're gonna be interested in other people's private parts, whether that be adults or kids. They may have, you know, touch breasts, their mother's breasts, other people's breasts. There might be some, you know, mild fascination with, with breasts because they themselves maybe don't have them and they, they've seen them when their, child, uh, when their parent is either getting dressed or in the shower. Um, they can ask questions about their own and others' bodies, bodily functions, peeing, pooping, you know, all of that sort. And obviously, there a lot of times if they're in a social environment with other similarly aged children, they can talk to other children about their body parts and their bodily functions, and that that is very typical and very normal. Between four and six years of age, we start to get a little bit more um, discriminating about which behaviors we do in front of others versus separately. There can be some purposeful touching of private parts. So basically the recognition that the touching of private parts can feel not bad or even um, somewhat good as a younger child can start to essentially take root. And, and those children may try to re-experience those, those feelings of, of touching their private parts more in private. Or if it does occur in public and they're redirected, then obviously that might continue in private thereafter. Um, they, again, will probably actively try to watch other people undress either of the same uh, biological sex or other. And they might try to, you know, mimic dating behavior, play house, you know, imaginative play is very, uh, can be very extensive or very profound at this age. And, and you know, this, this type of behavior development can be part and parcel to that as well. Um, obviously, you know, playing doctor, exploring private parts of others who are of their same age, and that's a really important caveat, uh, you know, can be relatively typical for this age too. Obviously, there are points at which it becomes atypical, but that's the whole point of kind of describing the progression throughout ages that we can go back and determine, you know, is this more likely to be typical or atypical? Between seven and 12 years of age, um, again, um, masturbation typically um, will be private um, because it's understood that that's not something that you would do in front of others. Um, again, the, the game playing, you know, playing house, playing family, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, still trying to attempt to explore others' bodies, usually just from a, a viewing standpoint. And they may be interested in looking at pictures of naked or partially naked people, whether that be on the internet, um, whether that be in books, just depends or on media. Um, obviously, regardless of their desire to look at sexual content in the media, it's, it's there. Um, so just by virtue of watching television or, you know, shows or Netflix or whatever, they'll, they'll likely be exposed to that type of content um, just by virtue of, of, you know, being a human watching television. And at this age, they start to desire more privacy, privacy while changing, privacy, um, maybe like with toileting, privacy about, you know, their body's development and, and maybe even wearing different clothes or starting to wear bras or different things like that. And that, that can be a very private and individual experience. Obviously, around that age, usually, I mean, it can, I mean, I've had eight and nine year olds have 
tell me about crushes on people, but you know, 10, 11, 12, when they're starting to get in those mid middle school years, they can start to have some sexual attraction or interest in peers. Um, so that's again, very normal, very typical, not something that we would ascribe to any um, type of like concerning behavior or traumatic past or anything like that. In general, you're going to see differences in children for a couple of reasons. So age is a big one. Obviously, the closer they get to puberty, the more hormonal effects they're going to have on their sexual behavior development and the more that's going to mediate that process. Um, observe, observing adults in the environment ends up being a really big player. Um, oftentimes when I'm collecting history, especially of children who, who are presenting with concern for problematic sexual behaviors, I'm asking about, you know, exposure to nudity in the home, whether that be parents changing in front of children or older, older siblings changing in front of children, um, whether or not that child sleeps in the same bedroom as the parents, whether or not they've, you know, inadvertently witnessed any sexual contact between parents, which is not super uncommon. Um, and obviously, if, if, you know, a parent decides to watch more adult media in the home while a child is around, maybe not watching with the child, but a child is around, that could obviously expose them to those types of sexual contact or sexual content, sorry. The teachings about sexual behavior, either by caregivers, teachers, others in their environment who maybe have more of a, a supervisory or a guiding role, um, can, can dictate how they feel about certain behaviors and, and, you know, whether or not those behaviors are typical. Again, you know, if we're using research and literature to guide that discussion, then I think that that's helpful. But if, if it's more of a you know, a morality or a punitive discussion that can obviously really reframe sexual behavior development, even typical sexual behavior development as something, you know, dirty or wrong um, when it, you know, when really um, we should be, you know, in a perfect world, we would be um, more at ease discussing this, this type of behavior, this type of development and things like that. But we don't, and it's wildly difficult for anyone, even someone who, you know, talks about sex abuse all day, like me, <laughs> so, or talks with folks who've been sexually abused and including small children. So, I mean, it's a difficult discussion to have regardless. In general, the anticipatory guidance that I give to caregivers when they witness sexual behaviors, especially if that's the reason why they're presenting to the Child Advocacy Center, is to try their best to stay calm you know, try, in a, you know, they can do whatever they need to do. Um, some parents that I've had um, have told me that they have their own sexual abuse history or sexual violence history, and that can really influence their ability, their response to witnessing sexual behaviors in, in young children or their children. And so recognizing that that might be a potential trigger um, and, and uh, essentially working towards maintaining that calm, observing actually what's going on, being able to describe that in more plain terms so that it can be discussed with a counselor or a physician or someone who, who is able to better understand typical versus atypical behavior is really important. I do encourage parents, <clears throat> especially for behaviors that are less typical. So not necessarily like just the, the self-exploration or even asking to see someone else's genitals, but maybe um, if they're observing more uh, children, especially young children doing more um, unusual like sex acts or sex acts that, that developmentally, maybe they, they shouldn't be. Obviously asking about you know, having the parent ask the child as calmly as possible, you know, what were you doing? Have you seen this before? Where did you see this before? Um, and then noting their affect. So usually children um, with problematic sexual behaviors oftentimes will display some agitation. Um, the behaviors seem to be very repetitive and persistent and resistant to parents stopping them. Um, and it can cause a lot of frustration in children. So getting a, a feel about their affect um, as those behaviors are occurring and then after during that conversation can be helpful information um, that the parent can then relay to the provider as well. In general, if that behavior is going to fall into the category of more typical sexual behavior for age, 
or um, if multiple children are involved again with relatively typical, you know, exploratory behavior who are roughly the same age. So within either the same age or within a year or two, but likely within the same grade level, within the same preschool class, then we like to encourage parents to have the discussion about like healthy boundaries that you know it's it's okay for you to explore your other pri privates it's okay to be curious about other kids privates or even adult you know that that type of development or bodily development but privates are private and usually you know at that age especially the younger age groups they won't necessarily have defined terms for their genital area so parents obviously have a lot of control over that discussion and helping guide not only um the way children express themselves with their typical sexual with their sexual behaviors but also the way that they're referring to their own anatomy um, and sometimes that can be helpful um, for kids because the word private you know means secretive it means you know um you know keep to themselves and things like that so sometimes calling them private parts can further reinforce the message that you know exploration can be normal but it should be you know a private thing um again the more explicit discussion of that would be actually naming places that are private so you know that maybe that's in the bathroom maybe that's in their bedroom somewhere where that behavior is not directly observable to the general public that would make it more atypical Something I also talk to caregivers about usually again in the context of asking about a child's exposure to sexual content and media, um, whether that be on phones and television, et cetera, is promoting safer media usage or at least more restrictive uh, media usage. So direct or indirect supervision, either by you know, apps or parental controls, um, providing alternate uh, appropriate alternatives, say if you know, a parent wants to watch a television program that does have some relatively explicit sexual content, which is not super uncommon on adult programming, um, you know, identifying other things that the child could be doing um, that is not directly observable or even changing the time that the parent is watching that particular program just to be more aware of, of kind of what they're doing. And then one of the things that um, we recommend now instead of good touch versus bad touch is discussing okay versus not okay touch there's a couple of reasons for that the good and bad um again can play into you know judgment and, and punitive and things like that and we're really trying to separate out any type of feeling of disciplinary action with regard to that child's normal sexual behavior development and we're really trying to establish boundaries safe boundaries healthy boundaries and the boundaries shouldn't just be with strangers they really need to be with with anyone especially for children obviously who aren't getting any help with potty training and things like that there's really no reason for an adult other than you know if they have to look at a wound or if they you know if, if the child's complaining of something for you know especially you know an uncle or someone who doesn't visit very often to you know watch the child undress or anything like that and trying to make sure that that is understood can be really important unfortunately the vast well for all maltreatment actually the vast majority of perpetrators are going to be either the primary caregivers of the child or secondary caregivers they're going to be someone who's in the family or close to the family who has access to the child and sexual abuse is no different so establishing that okay versus not okay touch can be really helpful because again we're trying to define you know what is okay so what you know what is it okay for the child to do what is it okay for other people to do and what is not okay to the point where if it's not okay you know we need to tell mom dad aunt uncle teacher someone um part of the other reason why we don't do good versus bad touches is, is that not all you know bad touches feel bad and when i'm talking to parents about okay versus not okay touch or even when i'm talking to to you know older well younger school age children about okay versus not okay touch you know i'm trying to take it away from that good or bad conversation to what is you know what is healthy for you versus what's not healthy for you or not okay for you as a as a person i also ask that you know folks you know teaching a four-year-old to to say the word vagina or anus you know i i get the the push to do that but it can be it can be pretty difficult so having at least recognizable names for anogenital and breast area can be helpful, whether that's, again, private parts or things, you know, but um, 
pocketbook, butterfly, cookie, you know, those things can be very difficult um, to understand for folks who are not in the family. Again, typical sexual behaviors are going to generally be spontaneous. They're going to occur between children of similar ages and sizes who know each other pretty well. They're going to be relatively voluntary, so nobody should be distressed and easily diverted if a caregiver were to witness the behavior and respond to it. They should be relatively infrequently observed. And most of the observable behaviors are going to take place in the younger children, again, because they're going to have less perception of the, the public eye. The environmental factors that we talked about before that can increase observable sexual behaviors are going to be like family views on nudity and co-bathing. Obviously, if there is exposure to sexual acts, either in person or via media, the extent of supervision. So obviously, if there's less supervision and less kind of guidance with regard to when it's OK to have those exploratory sexual behaviors, when it's not, then obviously without that guidance, they can become more observable because that guidance hasn't been provided. And then stressors. In general, a typical child's sexual behavior development is much more rare. Um, and it's usually going to be characterized by displaying sexual acts that are well beyond that child's developmental stage, including things like um, aggressive acts against other children, even aggressive acts against the child themselves, essentially doing something harmful to themselves. That's a sex act can be seen. Fewer than 1.5% of children surveyed displayed the sexual behaviors that are listed below that for younger children, so children less than 10, would essentially raise concerns for that atypical sexual behavior. In general, other characteristics of more atypical child sexual behavior, again, are going to be the use of threats, force, coercion, larger age gaps, usually the four-year age range, so a child a gap of four years essentially between the children if it is um, two children engaging in an act or different developmental levels. So regardless of chronological age, if you have maybe two children who are closer in age, but one has, you know, pretty significant or profound intellectual disability and functions more at a, as a much younger child, then obviously that would still apply. And then the displaying of an emotion, strong emotional response, especially when they're trying to be either distracted or diverted from doing the behavior. In general, the children with atypical sexual behaviors may have more internalizing and externalizing symptoms or behaviors. And sometimes you will see a change in the caregiving environment, um, such as even just a change in location, change in caregivers, change in daycares. Obviously, if a parent or a primary caregiver were to leave, then that would be a profound change for that child that can trigger the development of more atypical behaviors. So this sexual behavior development applies to children between two and six years of age. So it's always really important to understand what age group you're referring to. And I, I really like this chart. It's, it's an AAP clinical report. And essentially, it goes through more normal behaviors, less common behaviors, uncommon behaviors, and rarely normal behaviors. And it actually lists out what they would recommend collecting in regard to history or even reports to child protective services with regard to those behaviors. The rarely normal behaviors are the ones that I tend to focus on the most, although I, I spend quite a bit of time in this arena as well. But essentially the persistent behaviors, the mood changes, the ones involving aggression or coercion, um, ones involving animals, obviously um, it's far more atypical and should raise concerns. Uh, it's, not, it's not super common that we hear about that, but when we do, it definitely heightens our level of concern. Obviously, anything that's resulting in pain to the child or another child that involves a sexual behavior should raise uh, concerns. So in general, sexual behavior problems are gonna be in children younger than the age of 12 that are initiating behaviors involving sexual body parts that are developmentally inappropriate or harmful to themselves or others. So the key concepts of sexual behavior problems as derived from the literature would be behaviors that are intrusive in life, they're developmentally inappropriate, dependent upon that child's age, and they are either abusive to themselves or they're harmful, uh, sorry, abusive to others or harmful to themselves. It's known by a couple other names. I like sexual behavior problems, um, to use that term. I don't know why. I don't really, it, it's just a preference of mine, but you can use any term you like. 
So existing literature does indicate that multiple non-sexual traumatic experiences appear to have more of an influence on the development of atypical sexual behaviors than sexual abuse alone. So not all sexual behavior problems are going to be the result of, of sexual abuse. And I think that's really important to recognize and to reconcile because that's going to be the first thing that that all parents think is that, you know, if the child's manifesting sexual behavior problems, then that obviously means that they were sexually abused. And there's actually not as strong of a relationship as we thought. There's definitely a relationship, but multiple other traumatic events in a child's life can contribute to this development. So sexual behavior problems becoming sexual abuse or sexual assault. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a note that we're over time. Uh, so I can kind of buzz through the rest of this. I started about five minutes late, so I just need about five more minutes probably if that's all right. But um, so typically we're gonna have kids over 12 years of age. Um, Developmentally, obviously, most of them are going to have hit puberty. Legally, if a child is 12 years of age or older, it does have a higher likelihood of becoming court active, especially, obviously, in criminal court, um, you know, for better or for worse. And obviously, it's going to be related to the way that sexual behavior problems are uh, described. And it's obviously going to need it to involve a second non-consenting party. In general, when we compare adolescents with non-sexual delinquency to those with sexual delinquencies, um, we see more severe abuse history. We see kids who have had uh, increased exposure to things like sexual violence, pornography, and unfortunately, they tend to have higher recidivism rates with regard to repeat crimes, especially sexual offenses. Again, uh, in general, when you're evaluating a child who's presenting for concern for problematic sexual behavior or sexual behavior problems, we really need to know a couple things. The age of the child, the developmental level of the child to figure out if those two match or don't. A broad narrative history from the parent in their own words. And then usually what I'll do is I'll whittle down to the details and I'll have them objectively describe as much as possible what they saw, as opposed to using interpretive words like humped or had sex or thrusted. I want to know exactly kind of what the parents saw, if anybody else was involved, if objects were involved. I want to know if the child was clothed or unclothed. I want to know if it's a particular, particularly aggressive description. Did they injure themselves? Um, if they actually witnessed insertion, that can be a really helpful facet as well. Um, obviously, like we discussed before, a, a parent's reaction to that child's behavior can really influence the extinguish, extinguishment, essentially, of that behavior or the perpetuation. So asking about how the child responded or how the parent responded to the child, asking the parent if that behavior has recurred again, and if so, did it, was it the same, did it escalate? Do they have any concerns for maltreatment of their child, including sexual abuse? And does their child have any concerning anogenital symptoms that need to be evaluated? Oftentimes, you're going to see um, parents having either a subjective adult interpretation of a non-sexual behavior or a parent parental observation of a typical sexual behavior. And obviously, the third uh, outcome or the third choice is uh, appropriate parental identification of typical sexual uh, atypical sexual behavior. Oftentimes when we're determining what evaluation needs to be done for children, we are trying to determine the type of contact to help guide um, our thoughts about transmission risk and also the age of the children because younger children have lower prevalence of STIs, they have lower rates of acquiring STIs even when exposed, so really taking that into consideration can be helpful. Obviously, we're going to want to um, understand the extent of that behavior to determine whether or not CPS notification is indicated or not. And oftentimes, if there are coercive behaviors, significant behaviors, harmful behaviors, we are going to recommend a, a report to CPS for concern for risk of harm. Depending upon the age of the child and, and how they are being seen, oftentimes we're going to be uh, recommending that providers, if they're capable, are screening, especially older children, for other 
uh, psychiatric conditions. So things like conduct disorder, ADHD, and ODD tend to be very prevalent in this population. Um, obviously, if, if that type of screening is out of your wheelhouse, just like it's out of my wheelhouse, then, then speaking to folks like Miss Antoine or referring to psychology or psychiatry can be extremely helpful. In general, uh, and I have two more minutes, so I'll just kind of summarize the next couple of slides, but when you're seeing it at the um, the victimized child for concern for sexual abuse or sexual assault. You know, if the caregiver is the one that witnessed the act, it's perfectly acceptable to get the history from the caregiver. Again, we're going to want them to provide an accurate and objective description as much as possible um, to be able to decide upon next steps. Um, if the child wants to tell you about what happened, then, then I encourage providers to be at least willing to, to listen and have that conversation as opposed to shutting that child down or, or, or not allowing them to speak, only because sometimes, obviously, if they are feeling traumatized, sometimes relaying that, that narrative can be helpful in their recovery. When you're evaluating children, obviously, um, for concern for child on child sexual abuse or assault, you're going to want to know the ages of the children, the type of relationship, mostly for safety planning, when the exposure or the contact occurred, the type of contact, history of previous contact or previous behaviors, symptoms, any history of STIs, especially when it's a much older child and a much younger child. And I like to ask uh, children if they have concerns about their own body. Obviously, if this is an acute or an emergency department setting, that conversation may be better left for the CAC once that kind of emergency situation has been taken care of. If you're making a CPS report with regard to sexually reactive youth, we're going to need as much demographic information as possible. And this can be extremely difficult to collect because oftentimes the victimized child is coming in with their parent and that parent, depending upon their relationship with that child, either, you know, if it's a non-familial child, they might not know very much about that child. Or if they do know, they don't want to get them in trouble. And so it's important to to recognize that, you know, again, the, the CPS report is for concern for risk of harm of the offending child, that something could have happened to them that then led to the development of this behavior. And given the rarity of those types of behaviors, it deserves evaluation. Most severe behaviors don't go away or get better on their own. Like we talked about before, it can be a sign of previous trauma, but it doesn't have to be. And again, a CPS report um, may be indicated. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now, just because, and let Miss Antoine go ahead and pull up her slide. Yes, okay. So again, my name is Yamale, and I'm going to be speaking today about the treatment of children with problematic sexual behaviors. I know that Dr. Green has already talked about All right, so when we talk about it. And um, but kids who have problematic sexual behaviors, you know, this, these are intrusive behaviors, they're coercive, um, there is a risk of harm, and they don't respond to parental intervention. They're frequent and they're secretive. And so when you have two kids, you know, are they playing doctor or are they playing OBGYN? And so when you have two kids, you have to also think about who they're playing with. You, you know, you have an eight-year-old playing with a six-year-old versus an eight-year-old playing with a 16-year-old. That's going to be much more different. However, the important thing is to remember that there is hope in treatment. And the first step, step excuse me, is a, a clinical assessment to examine that sexual behavior. And so many times these behaviors are a symptom of a larger issue with, um, that involves self-regulation. Things to consider when you're working with uh, kids who have PSB is that you have to be self-aware about your comfort level with the content, be adaptable in that language, and don't overreact. When a family comes to you and tells you that, you know, these kids are having, their kids are having these problems, um, you know, you have to listen in, in, and just be careful on how uh, your own, even facial expressions, but also don't underreact. Um, try to stay objective and be careful with biases. And then the biggest factor that's going to help these families and these kids is going to be family support. Without family support, this treatment is not going to be effective. Um, so when we talk about kids who have these behaviors, it's really important to think about the terms that we're used to hearing. These kids are not predators. These kids are not sexually deviant or pedophiles, sex offenders, or rapists, right? These terms can they have so much shame and negative connotations and stigma that it can lead to isolation. 
So we're thinking about what terms are, are, are right to use. Um, and Dr. Green had mentioned some of these. So sexually harmful behavior, problematic sexual behavior, or sexually reactive, intrusive, or aggressive, right? And so by doing this, by, by talking about the correct term, then he separates that behavior from the child. And he doesn't make you think of that child as sometimes an adult sex offender. Um, assessments, when you look at assessments, you gotta think about different ways to assess and what all you need to look at. So uh, things to consider as, you know, as a socioeconomical approach is their poverty level, um, what access they have to mental health treatment, uh, what their environment is like, what their boundaries are like at home their first experience to exposure. I know you guys have heard about this already, but you know, their media, every kid has um, some kind of social media or access to a phone or a tablet. And so what, they're, what are they watching? Who are they speaking with? Their trauma experience, um, you know, any history of se sexual or physical abuse, um, any emotional abuse, exposure to domestic violence, disruptions in care as well. And then other problematic behaviors and, or other mental health issues, you know, uh, that they also have depression, anxiety, and things like that. So the biggest thing is also that the treatment has to be individualized. Not one treatment is going to be okay for all the kids. You have to make them specific for that family. When you think about assessment, when you talk to the parents, you got to think, you have to ask the parents more on the child's developmental history in context of life events. Um, their family history, who makes up the family, where do they live, how often do they go back and forth, if that's the case. Social history, um, cultural issues, who their friends are, things like that, excuse me. Psychiatric treatment, um, are they having any other issues? Uh, have they been hospitalized before for other mental health issues? School history, um, what are their grades like? Who are they hanging out at school with? And then their medical history, just to make sure that we are covering, you know, all medical concerns as well. And then from the child, you want to understand their behavior. Where, how did it start? Who gave them the idea to start, the, you know, to, to do this? Um, where did they get exposed to, um, to get the idea to do that from? Um, when we talk about, and sorry, I'm talking really fast because I know we're short in time, but when we talk about treatment, there are assessment tools that we can use. Um, to better get to get a better understanding on how to treat the family, treat the child, and so some of the um, tools that we use, uh, one is called the Child Sexual Behavior Inventory, and that is a 38-item inventory um, that was developed to assess children who have been sexually abused. This yields a score of nine different items. So for example, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but boundary problems, exhibitionism, sexual interest, uh, their sexual anxiety, uh, voyeurism, or sexual intrusiveness. The child sexual behavior checklist um, is more for kids who are 12 years and older, and this gets the information from the parent's perspective as well. So one is from the child and one is from the parent you know, to learn a little bit more about the child's sexual history and from the parent's perspective. And then you have the weekly behavior report, which is just a weekly um, progress on, on how they're doing once they start treatment. Um, so when some of the recommendations when we evaluate these families is that this evaluation should be very specific, again, like I said, the recommendations should be individualized to that child, to that parent. If they live in two different homes, you know, individualized to the one parent and then the other parent. Family issues need to be addressed. It, you know, if they're going through a divorce or going through separation or anything going on in the home also has a big effect on how these children respond to treatment. Issues that trigger the, uh, the problematic sexual behavior. Other co-occurring conditions, right? Um, again, other behaviors that they may be portraying. And medication, one thing to remember is the medication is not going, no medication is going to cure these behaviors, but it can, they can help um, in treating other behaviors that these children may have, like depression or anxiety, ADHD, things like that. And what is their level of safety in the home and the community? Um, Again, because family you know, support is such an important component in treatment, 
um, developing that safety plan with that parent that involves supervision and monitoring is going to be huge. Helping the parent talk about privacy and sexual behavior rules at home, educating the parent about sexual, um, about healthy sexual development, and as well as sex education, how to talk to children about this. A lot of parents are scared on how to talk to their children about sex education. So you have to make it age appropriate, obviously, um, you know, but helping them facilitate that conversation or helping them figure out how to even start the conversation. Parenting strategies, what they can do if they see a child, if they see their child, um, you know, exposing themselves or, or any public sexual behaviors, then how to respond, right? That no, um, so they don't overreact. And so also I'm modeling appropriate physical affection. What does an appropriate hug look like? You know, so those things are really important and guiding that child towards positive peer groups. With the child, you want to help them recognize that the behavior that they're engaged in is inappropriate. You want to educate the child and practice with them regarding boundaries. Um, you want to have, again, um, age-appropriate sex education and teach them coping skills and self-control self strategies. That's going to be the biggest um, component as well as family support. Um, sex abuse prevention and safety skills. So talk, like Dr. Green said about, okay, I know okay touches, what does that mean? And then helping them improve their, their social skills. There are, you know, for, for treatment uh, of kids who have um, problematic sexual behaviors, it's important to choose the right treatment, in a sense, it's try, the right treatment modality. So this treatment modality has to be developmentally appropriate. So what's gonna work for a four-year-old is not gonna work for a 12-year-old. Um, it has to be evidence support, evidence-based supported, excuse me, and trauma-informed, right? And then again, and I just keep saying this, is family, that it has to be family-focused. Like whoever makes the family, then it needs to be involved in this treatment to maximize the benefits of it. And then it also has um, to be, it doesn't have to be restrictive. A lot of people think that because the kid, their kids are displaying these behaviors, they automatically need to go to a facility or a res residential facility. And that's not the case. A lot of these kids do very well at home as long as they have the right support system. Uh, there are different treatment models. Um, one of, the, there's three up here. So problematic sexual behavior, CBT, and that focuses on child development, emotional changes, communication, and supporting the child's coping mechanisms. And you have your multi-systemic therapy for kids who are older, and this works best um, for kids who, uh, where the juvenile justice system is also involved. And then my favorite, I think it's the trauma-focused CBT, and it works really well with kids who are three years old to 12. And this is an 18 session treatment plan. And it focuses on a lot of the different aspects of um, CBO, TFCBT, which is you know, child and caregiver component. It has a child and caregiver component. Um, it focuses on boundaries and prevention skills, safety planning, emotional regulation, coping mechanisms, and even making amends, which is really important. Uh, those are my references. So I just went through that really fast. I hope that this was helpful. And if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, and I hope you all have a great day.